Dear guests, welcome to the 10th seminar of our series, Historians and the War, Rethinking the Future. Titled this time, The Human Toll of a War, Comparative Perspectives on Migration, Resettlement, and Immigration of Ukrainians in the 20th and 21st centuries. First, a small technical announcement. The seminar today will last about two hours. At the end, we will have a Q&A section where questions from the audience can be discussed. So if you have questions for our panelists, please write them down into the chat. As always, this seminar will be recorded and later be published on the YouTube channel of the German-Ukrainian Historians Commission. I will post the link to the channel and our partner institutions into the chat during the seminar. The languages of today's discussion will be Ukrainian and English. There is the option of simultaneous translation. If you want to hear the translation, please click on the icon of the globe at the right bottom of the screen. Thank you for your patience. And now I would like uh, Ms. Gelinana Grinchenko to say a few words about our webinar series. Thank you, Georgia, dear colleagues, dear friends. Welcome to the 10th seminar series Historic and War, the reassessment of the future. This series we started in June this year. І е, цю серію зініціювали е, п'ять організацій. Саме Німецько-Українська комісія істориків, Канадський інститут українських студій, Міжнародний інтелектуальний часопис «Україна модерна», кафедра історії Східної Європи Мюнгенського університету та Український католицький університет у місті Львів. Семінари відбуваються за фінансової підтримки фонду Конрада Аденаура у Києві, а також за участі Німецької служби академічних обмінів за кошти Міністерства закордонних справ Німеччини та за участі Федерального міністерства освіти та досліджень Німеччини. Цей десятий семінар має назву «Людська дань війни. Переміщення, переселення, еміграція українців у 20-21 століттях у порівняльній перспективі». Він проводитиметься, як вже е, сказав Георгій, українською та англійською мовами з синхронним перекладом. Я маю честь е, представити модераторку сьогоднішнього семінару, пані професорку Наталію ханенко Фрізен, професорку університету Альберти та директорку Канадського інституту українських студій. Будь ласка, пані Наталі, семінар відкритий. Дуже дякую за а, привітання до всіх наших гостей. I will be speaking in English to keep up with the tradition, partially because I'm connecting from Canada and we do have guests who are English speaking participants in today's seminar. We are in the eighth months of the war and we are witnessing not only the loss of life as it's happening on the front lines, but we are of course facing major displacement of Ukrainian nationals, which is, uh, seem to, to be seen as another toll of the war, of course. Before we launch in the conversation on the implications and ramifications of this massive displacement, I'd like to introduce our speakers, who are the experts in the field, historians, also those who have dovetailed in sociology and have spent a lot of time working exactly on those topics, reflecting on the fate and dimensions and proportions of displacement of Ukrainians after the World War II, but also after 2014. Our first speaker today is Dr. Lyubomir Lutsuk. Uh, Lyubomir Lutsuk is a professor of political geography in the Department of Political Science and Economics at the Royal Military College of Canada. He has authored, edited, and co-authored 32 books and had dozens of opinion editorials published in every major Canadian newspaper on a range of topics, including Ukraine in the Second World uh, war, uh, Holodomor, Canada's first national internment operations, and post-World War II immigration of Ukrainian displaced persons to Canada. Dr. Lutsuk also served as a governor in cabinet appointee to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada and the Parole Board of Canada, and being an active member of the Ukrainian-Canadian Civil Liberties Association. In 2019, he was awarded the Cross of Ivan Mazepa by Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and in 2022, declared a person non grata by the Russian Federation. I guess another honor to, to, to celebrate. In March, 2023, we are all anticipating the publishing of yet another book by Dr. Lutsuk by McGill Queens University Press, which is titled Enemy Archives, Soviet Counterinsurgency Operations, and the Ukrainian nationalist movement, 
This book is co-edited with Dr. Volodymyr Vyatrovich. Our next speaker is Dr. Oksana Mikheva. Dr. Mikheva is currently uh, at the university, European University Vardina, Frankfurt on the Oder in Germany. But we also know her as a professor of sociology department at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. Before 2014, Dr. Mikheva worked at the Donetsk State in University of Management. Professor Mikheva joined uh, UCU in September 2014, having been forcibly displaced by the war in Eastern Ukraine from her native Donetsk. So we obviously have personal perspective probably coming our way from Oksana as well today. She's a member of the International Association for the Humanities, Tarashachenko Scientific Society, Ukrainian Sociological Association, member of the editorial board of academic peer-reviewed journals, Ukraina Moderna and East and the East. Her research areas include historical aspects of deviant and delinquent behavior, urban studies, paramilitary motivation in Ukraine, social integration and adaptation of internally displaced uh, persons from war-torn regions, and strategy of resettlement and adaptation of last waves Ukrainian migrants. She has experience in, organi in organizing and implementing of more than 20 sociological projects, including surveys, focus group discussions, in-depth interviews, and content and discourse analysis. There's definitely uh, a lot that can be shared today by Dr. Mikheva with us. And I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Victoria Sereda, who we also know to be very active in the field of displacement studies. Victoria is currently serving as a research fellow at the Imre Kertesh, Kertesh College, Jena, a senior researcher in the Department of Social Anthropology, Institute of Ethnology and National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in Lviv, and also a professor of Ukrainian Catholic University. In spring semester 2021, she was also visiting lecturer at the University of Basel. We know Dr. Serda's focus uh, ranges widely and it includes urban sociology, memory studies, nationalism, migration, identity studies, and she has led or participated in over 30 sociological research projects on Ukrainian society and its regional dimensions. Amongst the leaders are region, nation, and beyond, an interdisciplinary and transcultural reconceptualization of Ukraine, a project which is taking place at St. Gallen University. And also the other project was of our mentioning here, Ukraine's Hidden Tragedy, held at Birmingham University. Since 2016, she's been working on a very important project of MAPA. It is the one which is coordinated by Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute titled Digital Atlas of Ukraine, and she's responsible for key models there, history and identity, language, religious, uh, religious revolution, and Donbass and Crimea. Most recent publications include the, uh, those, so social dis distancing and hierarchies of belonging, the case of displacement population from Donbass and Crimea. This is the publication which came in 2020, and uh, slightly earlier, there was another one. I am a man, an active citizen. I did not betray my state. Public activism and identity issues in Ukraine after Euromaidan. This has come out in 2018. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation today. And I'd like to thank our presenters for finding time and opportunity to join us today. I also would like to thank everybody in the audience, and especially those in Ukraine who are connecting to be with us despite all the complications and challenges which you are probably facing right now on the ground, wherever you are. Let us turn to the conversation itself. We, as I have mentioned, one of the outcomes of this, call it geopolitical crisis, but of course it is also a Russia's war on Ukraine, has been the massive out of scale proportions displacement of population from Ukraine currently, as of October 3rd, most recent statistics points out to at least 14.5 million individuals who have been displaced from their places of residences in Ukraine. 7.5 million are, are those who have reached out, out uh, countries outside of Ukraine and some 7 million are considered to be displaced internally. These are out of scale proportions. In the world, 
in 2021, for comparison purposes, the United Nations calculated about 89 million people of displaced uh, status. The war in Ukraine have recently added those 14, well, that, those 7.5 millions and more. And currently we are beyond that mark of 100 million displaced peoples around the world thanks to this war or because of the war. We also are uh, obviously facing uh, unique enough situations in each and every country. But this war is not the first one when displacement has taken place. Other major cataclysms of the war, such as World War II, for example, have seen the same displacement taking place. Uh, many Ukrainians have been forced to leave. And we do have an expert in our room to comment on that particular historical involvement in the context of Ukraine's history. I'd like to turn first to uh, Lyubomir Utsuk, uh, who is an expert on World War II. World War II displaced many Ukrainians who found refuge in a number of countries, as I've mentioned today. And their experiences of resistance, of uh, persecution, and especially their refusal to return to the USSR informed not only their lives, but also the, the lives of many, gener well, of other generations who followed them in their new places as residences. What were the dimensions of that post-World War II experience, displaced persons experience crisis? What were the outcomes of such displacement for the displaced persons themselves? And also looking back on that experience of that generation, can we think of what might have been the impact of that experience overall on Ukraine, the Ukrainian diaspora, and perhaps also on the world? So those are a couple of questions I thought I will put your for forward for you, Lubomir, and you probably have a few things to add along the lines. Please take, take over. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate uh, to all the sponsoring organizations. Well, as was just mentioned, millions of Ukrainians were displaced during and after the Second World War, uh, which for Ukrainians, I think we can properly say, began not in September of 1939, but actually earlier in March of 1939, when Karpatho, Ukraine was suppressed. At any rate, the war, the Second World War, continued for Ukrainians well beyond what we consider to be the end of that war in the West, namely the 8th of May, 1945, or VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Because as we all know, uh, Ukrainians continue to resist Soviet rule in the ranks of the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA, and the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, for at least a decade, and in fact, beyond that. Uh, so there was a continuing forcible displacement of population taking place from 1939 well into the mid-1950s and perhaps even a bit beyond. As this was happening, there were several problems that we have to address at the beginning. First of all, and probably most importantly really, is that the world at that time did not recognize Ukraine as a state nor Ukrainians as a nation. Some of this was ignorance, some of this was indifference, and some of this was outright hostility to the very notion of a Ukrainian state or Ukrainians as a people. As all this was unfolding between 1939 and 1945, and then with the end of the Second World War, millions of people, nevertheless, were being physically relocated throughout Europe, and several million people whom we would call Ukrainians found themselves in Western Europe at war's end. Among them were a significant number of Ukrainians from Velika Ukraina or Soviet Ukraine. And under the terms of the Yalta agreement, all of these people were to be returned to the Soviet Union, whether they wanted to go or not. So one of the great tragedies of the immediate post-war period, 1945-46, was that literally some 2 million Ukrainians, Soviet citizens so-called, were forced, were obliged to return to the Soviet Union under the terms of the Yalta Agreement and were forced to go there under the bayonets of the Americans, the British, the French, and I unfortunately have to admit the Canadians as well. 
So literally a very large proportion of the Ukrainians who found themselves in Western Europe as a result of the war were forced to go back to Eastern Europe to the Soviet state at the end of the war. And of course, many of them suffered a very unhappy fate. Um, what this did to our diaspora uh, is twofold. First of all, anyone who survived, who got away from forcible repatriation had to lie to survive. If you were obliged to return to the Soviet Union because you were a Soviet citizen and you somehow end up in Canada, the United States, Australia, Western Europe, or wherever, the only way you could do that was by pretending to be someone from Western Ukraine, someone, for example, who had Polish citizenship because Poles weren't being forcibly repatriated, which meant you basically had to lie to the authorities, to the allied control officials, to the Soviet repatriation and resettlement commissions. This meant that when you came to Canada, for example, 1949, 1950, you were from, say, Kharkiv, you were a Soviet citizen, but you pretended you were from Lviv, and you're in Canada, and you get your Canadian naturalization, you become a citizen of Canada, you have misled the authorities, you have told them a lie about who you were, your citizenship before the war, and so on, which means you're here, in a sense, under false pretenses. Now, why does this matter? Well, you might say, who cares? You know, they, they got here, good for them, they survived. Well, think about it for a moment. Most of these East Ukrainians, I'll call them Eastern Ukrainians, were actually survivors, witnesses to the whole of the war. So the West not only sent back millions of people who could have testified about the genocidal Great Famine of 1932-33 in Soviet Ukraine, but also those who survived and managed to escape forceful repatriation were essentially silenced because of the fear that if they'd said something, they might then lose their citizenship. So many survivors of the whole the war were silenced, not only by the Soviets and their disinformation campaigns, but by the West. And this is one of the great tragedies we need to think about. Now, the Ukrainian lands were during the Second World War, certainly at the epicenter of what Professor Timothy Snyder has referred to as the bloodlands. Although I question his chronology, because as I've already said, the war did not end for Ukrainians in May of 1945. What is worth underscoring at this point is that Ukrainians before the first uh, the Second World War found themselves under the control of various what we now call settler colonial regimes that repeatedly subjected them to ethnic cleansing and indeed genocide. This is something that occurred before, during, and after the Second World War. So at the end of the war, May 1945, you find millions of people who call themselves Ukrainians in Western Europe, but their fate is certainly uncertain. Now, they did receive some help, and I think this is worth pointing out. In the immediate post-World War period, there was the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, called UNRWA, and later there was the International Refugee Organization, IRO. These were two international organizations that attended to the physical needs and security of the millions of refugees and displaced persons or DPs who found themselves in Western Europe at the end of the war, most of whom wanted to go home. If you were a French citizen and you've been taken by the Germans into the Third Light as a slave laborer, after the war's end, you want to go home to France. Makes good sense. But for many Eastern Europeans, and particularly Ukrainians, this was not a welcome choice. They were also aided by Ukrainian Canadians primarily young men and women who had volunteered for service overseas during the war in the ranks of the Canadian Armed Forces and Merchant Marine. These young men and women who came from all across Canada established in London, England during the war, an organization called the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's Association, UCSA. And they rented premises in Notting Hill Gate in the parish of St. James, and there they established their own London club, where they met for social and religious and cultural purposes during the war. But as they moved on to the continent after D-Day in June of 1944, many of these very same Ukrainian Canadians in uniform began encountering Ukrainian refugees and displaced persons and victims of the war. As soon as that happened, they began to realize that this was an opportunity for them 
to rescue and resettle these Ukrainians who did not want to return to the Soviet Union into places like Canada, the United States, Australia, and so on. So they created an organization called the Central Ukrainian Relief Bureau, headquartered in London, and then later it had outposts on the continent, CURB, is the way they called it. It was sustained financially by the Ukrainian Canadian Relief Fund and the Ukrainian Canadian Committee or Congress as it's known now, and by various funds that came from the United States. These activists lobbied actively for nearly a decade after the end of the Second World War to rescue and resettle these Ukrainian refugees, displaced persons and victims of the war. So they are quite properly called, as we've described them, the heroes of their day. They were in fact largely responsible for the immigration to Canada in the so-called third wave of Ukrainian settlers to Canada. There was the first wave that came before the First World War, the interwar period wave, and then the third wave, the first about 170,000 people between 1891 and 1914. The second wave came in the interwar period, about 70,000 people. The third wave displaced persons, 35 to 40,000 people. Uh, but they were resettled and they were in fact rescued from Soviet uh, repatriation missions and allowed to uh, rebuild their lives in Canada. Now, when you put this in sort of historical context, what do we see today? We see again, a genocidal war being waged against Ukraine and against Ukrainians. And I think it's a very important thing that we need to underscore in all of our discussions. This is a genocidal war, the purpose of which is to erase Ukraine as a state from the map of Europe and to diminish or erase Ukrainians as a nation from the world. So it's a genocidal agenda. As we've already heard, millions of Ukrainians as a result of this have been internally displaced, 7.8 7 million people, and millions have been obliged to cross the 1991 borders of Ukraine to escape the violence. And they found shelter in places like Poland uh, and Georgia, in Turkey. I saw them myself when I was there in May of this year. And of course, they've been welcomed and have received support from many countries in Western Europe, for which I think we can all be properly grateful. Some of these people, of course, have gone further. We're beginning to see Ukrainian refugees resettling in Canada, in the United States, in Australia, and throughout, in fact, the rest of the free world. Now, I want to make a point here the humanitarian impulse that supports the relief and the support that Ukrainians are being given around the world is very welcome and it's very genuine. But at the same time, let us never forget that Canada in particular, and indeed all the other countries I've just mentioned, are benefiting from and utilizing these unanticipated population displacements to further their own immigration and labor agendas. This is to the benefit of Canada that young people are coming here uh, who are displaced by this war. I also want to make a point that we sometimes forget, which is that there are also other Ukrainians, particularly unaccompanied children and orphans, who are being forcibly relocated into the Russian Federation which is in and of itself a crime against humanity and could be defined as genocide as well. So on the one hand, we could say, well, there's nothing new. We have millions of people who call themselves Ukrainian, who are seeking refuge and asylum in the face of a genocidal onslaught orchestrated by the Russian Federation, the successor state of the Soviet Union. So what's new? But actually there is much that is new and let me make some comparisons. First, uh, the one thing that I think we all need to uh, always remember is that these Ukrainians who have been displaced, particularly since the, 20, uh, the early February of, tw of 22, uh, and even those displaced since 2014, are not convention refugees. There is a definition of what a refugee is adopted by the United Nations, and Ukrainians today do not meet that definition. Why? Well, because there is a Ukrainian state, and that Ukrainian state has internationally recognized borders, and those borders have been in place since 1991, and that state is still existing. It is still defending itself. It is defending itself against the aggression of the Russian Federation, and it can offer protection to its citizens. Now, hardly perfect protection, but it can. 
So most countries in the world today do not recognize the migrants that we're discussing as being convention refugees. And so instead of processing them through the Immigration and Refugee Board, which I was once served on, there are all sorts of new immigration programs and humanitarian relief efforts, some of them private, some of them state sponsored. Um, that are being put into place to help somehow support these people in their time of need. But again, there's very little coordination among these various religious groups and community-based volunteers, most of them non-Ukrainian, when it comes to helping these migrants. In my own very small city of Kingston, Ontario, a city of 125, 130,000 people, we have received approximately 50 people from Ukraine in the last several months. There is some effort on the part of the local community to help them and fundraising has come in and brought in funds from mostly non-Ukrainians, but there's very little coordination with the municipal or the provincial or the federal levels. It's almost ad hoc. But what is certainly clear is that these people are not being defined as convention refugees. However, what is very different and very, very important now is that these Ukrainian displaced persons are being recognized by the entire world as Ukrainians. That is a very far cry from the situation that prevailed after the Second World War. After World War II, people, diplomats, journalists, governments around the world questioned whether there was even such a thing as a Ukrainian and certainly denied the existence of a Ukrainian state. So Ukrainians were defined as Poles, they were defined as Soviet citizens, they were defined as anything but Ukrainian. So the very fact that in today's world, the world recognizes Ukrainians as a distinct people and knows that Ukrainians have their own state is a plus. Ukraine, therefore, is essentially recognized internationally, and indeed it has been since 1991. Now, you can say, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Surely they recognized Ukraine as a state because the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was a founding member of the United Nations. But in point of fact, in the reality of the world, no one really thought Soviet Ukraine was an independent state. It was only after 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Empire that Ukraine re-emerged as an independent state in Europe. Since the very blatant aggression against Ukraine, again, starting in 2014, but escalating dramatically after the 24th of February this year, world sympathy is certainly with Ukrainian Ukrainians. And I think that's been demonstrated amply by the massive amounts of humanitarian and now military aid that's been extended to Ukraine. So one big, big difference is that Ukraine as a state and Ukrainians as a nation are today known and recognized. And that is very dramatically different from what occurred after the Second World War. As well, and this is also important, and this is reflected in the panel today, Ukraine and Ukrainians themselves have reached out to the world over the past three decades since independence by developing a cadre of experienced diplomats and media influencers and journalists who have told the story of Ukraine and who continue to tell the story of Ukraine on a daily basis. And that has certainly garnished a great deal of sympathy among many people for Ukraine and countered Soviet era and Russian Federation regurgitated disinformation and propaganda about what Ukraine is, especially countering the Russian propaganda about how Ukraine is a nation governed by Nazis. In this, I think we have to pay particular tribute to the existence of a younger post-Soviet generation, young men and women born after 1991, who are not so Soviet citizens, never socialized in the Soviet system, who have become clearly a very determined cadre uh, with, when it comes to retaining uh, Ukraine's rightful place in Europe. Now, in the post-war period, as was mentioned, Ukrainians really had no choice and little interest in going home, yet psychologically, having experienced the years of war, and then in many cases, more time, years in fact, in DP camps, and then resettlement usually far from home, not in neighboring countries. Despite all that, many of them, my parents included, maintained what psychological uh, reporting at the time described as an abiding interest in the fate of their homeland. 
So psychologists who were associated with UNRWA and the allied uh, governments actually studied the DPs and said, these people have this strong desire to return home, but the home they dream about really isn't what's there now, and yet they are completely caught up in this desire to support it and return to it. So people like that, people like my mother, who was a slave of Germany, in a uh, slave laborer in Germany during the Second World War, or my father, who fought uh, the occupation regimes and then came west, uh, who met in a refugee camp in Freiman Kasern outside of Munich and lived there for several years before they found uh, resettlement opportunities here in Kingston, Ontario. They persisted in maintaining an interest in the fate of Ukraine and, of course, passed it on to me. You can't see it, but it's right behind me. There is a suitcase, the only piece of luggage that they had when they literally got off the boat in 1949, not speaking a word of English, with one suitcase, but determined that one day they would return to Ukraine. The joke used to be that the DPs in Canada were sitting on packed suitcases, ready to go back. Of course, they lived to see the independence of Ukraine, but most of them never returned. Nevertheless, for the decades that they were here in Canada, members of this third wave, not all, but a majority, I think, continue to promote Ukrainian culture, to promote Ukrainian studies among a wider public. And they came to have considerable influence, diffuse but important. So again, how do we compare this to what's happening today? Today, again, we have many Ukrainian displaced persons, a large number of them within Ukraine or nearby geographically. Many of them anticipate that they will soon be able to return home and many have already done so, certainly as soon as possible. Um, they have sown in their hearts a profound understanding of the fact that Ukrainians are not Russians, never were, and certainly after all of this never will be, that this has an effect that they have endured and survived Ukraine's war for independence. And that that has cemented a new kind of Ukrainian national identity, one that's based less on ethnicity and more on citizenship and a sense of having shared unanticipated miseries that were imposed by a foe. So I think what we're seeing happening now is the development of a Ukrainian identity that is going to profoundly influence the future of the Ukrainian state. As President Zelensky referred to it, perhaps Ukraine will become a second Israel in Europe. But very clearly, and I'm confident of this, the Ukraine that we see emerge out of this war and out of these forced population displacements will become a more powerful, more dynamic, and I think more successful state, frankly, than the one that emerged in 1991. Because the nature of Ukraine in the 21st century has actually been forged in a war. Now, some of the DPs, the internally displaced persons, will return home. Others that are abroad in Canada, the United States, and elsewhere will remain here in the free world because they already have or soon will discover personal opportunities for advancing and bettering themselves in life. And this, is, and this is perfectly normal. And I think I want to stress that. Not everybody will go home because life goes on and you live your life and you find opportunities. I'm, I've already witnessed this on a small scale level here in Kingston. But what I sense is that this so-called fifth wave, because we had a wave of people coming between 1991 and 2014 or 2022, were economic migrants, perhaps more like the earliest pioneer settlers who came seeking a better life, wrong with that, and who sought opportunity, and who perhaps uh, were less interested in Ukraine than the DPs after World War II were. Well, now we're getting a fifth wave. And this fifth wave is very much like that third wave. They fought for Ukraine, they survived the genocidal agendas of the Nazi and Soviet regimes, or in this case of the Russian Federation. They were told in some cases that they did not exist or should not exist and will certainly never exist in the future, which is Mr. Putin's line. And yet they continued to advocate for Ukraine's return to its rightful place in Europe, or in some cases in the modern period, fought for it. So this fifth wave that we're now seeing arriving in Canada is like the third wave in that it stands on guard for Ukraine. 
Just like in the past, the third wave did, so too the fifth wave stands on guard for Ukraine today. Now, how many of them will remain here when the war ends, and it will end? How will they transform the structures, the organizational institutions of the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada? How will they change the nature of Ukrainian Canadian society? I have no idea. But I can say in conclusion that we most certainly live in very interesting times. Thank you. Thank you, Lubomir, for giving us your perspective and your expert opinion and thoughts on the role of the third wave of Ukrainian immigration to the diaspora, which is represented by the DPs. You know, I am reminded of the fact that many indeed returned after 1991, after the Soviet Union's collapse and continued to contribute to Ukraine as now expats in Ukraine. And, you know, numerically, interestingly enough, that was not a very large influx of uh, DPs into the Western networks of diaspora. In Canada, we only accounted for 35,000 or so, but the impact, as you rightly pointed out, and the legacy, historically, culturally speaking, I think is very profound and deserves its, uh, its uh, further reflection. But you also rightly brought us into the context of today, and I'd like to turn uh, us now to the next phase of our conversation. We we are witnessing this ongoing displacement and it's of profound proportions. So what are the dimensions and the repercussions of the current Ukrainian crisis, the displaced persons crisis that was triggered or renewed, let's say renewed by the Russian war on Ukraine? How does this dispersal affect Ukraine in the short run and perhaps in the long run as well? How could this massive displacement affect the world? We have two more scholars in the room. I would, I, I think Oksana Mikheva, you wanted to go first. We'll, we'll start with you and then Victoria, you will, you will take over. So those are the questions for us now. First of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to this conversation. With Victoria, we play on one field and why it's very difficult to share and to divide our presentation. Uh, but um, we already have a lot of great ideas for discussion. Thank you very much, Pane Lubomere. I think we, we now have um, we now have an opportunity to start our discussion about this. For example, I immediately reacted to your idea about terminology. I know very well how words matter. And uh, for example, you talk about these uh, terms uh, refugees or displaced person we have the same discussion here and i have not unfortunately i have not clear answer to the question because i understand that the use of this general term i mean refugees here simplifies the process of their integration and allow for adaptation for existing legislation why it's so problematic but of course i prefer i personally prefer uh, internally displaced person or displaced person but uh, in this case uh, i think the refugee and using this term um, give a chance to many people to rap rapidly integrate it in this society but we come back i hope we come back to all of this issue but let me start with the dimension scale of the current Ukrainian refugee crisis. I use this term because uh, it's a term which use uh, usually use international organization when they describe this situation. And uh, in this case, I will talk about the uh, numbers of people uh, after full scale Russian invasion on 24th of February 2022. And uh, I will use uh, official data that provided by United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration. They uh, collect a huge data and uh, have a different kind of surveys and uh, talk about this very um, problematic uh, uh, situation, how to calculate people who are in the process of relocation. We are talking about people who are in move. It's a very, very complicated task to know how many, because of many different kind of nuances uh, of this uh, forced relocation. And of course, I use uh, the information from Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, and I checked this information right before the seminar. It's the last data, and according to the data provided by 
United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, now, the number of registered refugees from Ukraine in Europe is 7.7 .7 million. The number of refugees from Ukraine registered for temporary protection or similar national protection schemes in Europe is 4.4 million. According to the data provided by International Organization of Migration, over 7. million people have been internally displaced since the Russian invasion started. According to the survey, it's other type of uh, information. On the one hand, we have this uh, number of people who are registered in different forms, but on the other hand, we usually try to understand and uh, create this much more deeper understanding of the social demographic parameters of the group. And uh, in this case, the international organization or separate sociologists use the surveys. And according to the survey conducted, for example, by uh, international organization or migration, more than 50% of displaced households have children. 57% include elderly members and 30% have people with chronic illness, why it's so important from my point of view, because, for example, when we work with um, these um, um, forced displacement on the first stage of Russian aggression, now we have this opportunity to talk about the first stage, which uh, started uh, in 2014 and was before 20 to, uh, 24th of uh, February 2022. And uh, when we focus on this first stage, it was very important for, for us uh, to talk about how displaced people not like about homogeneous group, but like a very segmented group with different needs. When we are talking about this, uh, when we are talking about this group, like a homogeneous group, uh, it's create a very specific reaction from the point of view of the state, and state tried to cover all needs in one way, using one strategy. But it's absolutely wrong way, because we have a different groups of people, and why it's so important to detailize this group and talk about these specific uh, segments of this group, with children, for example, with elderly members, with people with chronic illness, because uh, the question about illness and health become a very, very important in the context of forced migration. Um, then, if we are talking about the uh, countries uh, which are hosted uh, now in Europe, Ukrainians, Poland is the obvious leader among the refugee hosting countries. There are 1.4 million Ukrainian refugees officially registered here. Then comes Germany with 1 million officially registered Ukrainian refugees. And third place in this ranking is the Czech Republic with near half a million officially registered Ukrainian refugees. According to uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Russia leads this ranking with 2.8 million Ukrainian refugees. However, it is totally incorrect to talk about these figures in this context. A significant proportion of these people are those who have been forcibly evacuated and in fact deported to Russia. But why it's so important to look on this number? Because for me, it's a question of dissemination of knowledge. When we present this data in such way, we create absolutely wrong perception of this situation. When Russia stay on this first position in this rank, it creates a situation that it's really real uh, uh, vectors of forced migration. And uh, here, it's absolutely incorrect to use this term refugees as, and this term is only partially applicable to Ukrainians in this case when we are talking about Russian vector of migration. And thank you, Pana Lubomir, you uh, raised this question about orphans who are forcibly evacuated and really deported to Russia Federation. And we know about many other cases which give us the opportunity to uh, make uh, a question to what the, uh, was the way of presenting of information. Then, uh, uh, the problem uh, in assessing to the scale of the phenomenon uh, and even more its consequences is that we are talking about processuality, Russian aggression against the great continents. And I still agree, absolutely agree, that no one knows how it will be in future. It's very, very difficult now to uh, um, to uh, evaluate uh, and to, to um, 
to evaluate the situation and to create this uh, future vision, how it will be and, uh, in future. Consequently, uh, consequently, both the number of refugees and the number of people who need aid and support are constantly increasing. We talk about this potentiality and we talk about the number which are constantly increasing. In this case, we are not talking about final figures, but uh, on, uh, uh, ones which are constantly changing and why it creates this different kind of difficulties in understanding and perception of this situation. As the front line has increased, the number of people who have found themselves directly in the war zone has increased. We also have a higher level of return migration, both from abroad and from places of displacement within the country. However, it should be understood that people are not returning to their former lives, to their previous lives. It's a very, uh, very, very important moment. And for example, uh, if I compare this uh, current situation with previous stage of Russian aggression, we see the um, very similar situation when people describe their forced migration and says that they want to come back to their city, cities, previous cities, but they understand that their cities are not exist. In reality, it's not possible to come back to the previous life. It's absolutely impossible to uh, uh, come back to previous life. And uh, of course, many people now understand this and they understood that uh, they are not returning to their former lives, but they try to do this and face with many problems uh, because usually many of our refugees use a so social network, social, uh, social media for receiving information and uh, uh, don't really understand what uh, happens in their previous place of living and why it's influenced these processes of return migration and uh, very often people back to Ukraine and then back to the, uh, their other places of forced relocation. All this becomes especially problematic given the Russian uh, targets uh, strikes on infrastructure in the context of the approaching winter. Consequently, migra migration, both internal and external, will potentially intensify and will be based not only on military action, but also on infrastructure problems. In any case, we are talking about an extremely difficult situation and the forced displace displacement of millions of people. The specific of social demographic structure of both refugees and IDPs in current situation must also be taken into account here. In this case, we are talking primarily about women and children. This is uh, in contrast, for example, to the situation in 2014. In our research, we have documented a complex family resettle, uh, resettlement strategy in which young family members and women were the first to leave. The men often stayed behind to guard the property. However, in the current situation, we have a much larger family gap due to the official restriction on men leaving Ukraine in wartime conditions. Accordingly, in this case, we are dealing with the problem of divided families, of one household living in two countries. This can be seen as diversifying economic risk at the family level from the point of view of uh, general theory of migration. But if in the families of migrant workers, this is based on rational choice. In this case, we are talking about the first decision for which no one was prepared. The first nature, nature of such migration, its unexpected nature slowed down the pace of integration. The question of the consequences of migration is too complex and depends on the duration of the war and the intensity of the hostilities. I have already talked about the procedural, uh, processual nature of the situation, which means that refugees are still balancing the desire to return. But many of our interlocutors, for example, says about this, they are waiting, they are sitting and waiting, they want to return. Uh, and they are balance, still balancing the desire to return and the need to integrate here. And the final decision depends not so much on the individual's personal choice, but on the context in which he or she finds themselves. And I'm maybe here, I'm happy to pass the words on Victoria.
Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, seminar and thank you for, for previous uh, speakers who already created a context uh, about which I'll be talking, taking slightly into different direction. And first of all, I want to start my, my talk with the Peter Gatrell's work on actually Second, First World War, where he illustrated that um, how the outbreak of war can dramatically change the established landscape of social and national identities. And he argues in his book that new this new category of refugee uh, created by war suddenly became an important social category and a factor of identity. And for millions of people, it has outweighed its, uh, many of their previous statuses, identities, influencing not only their perception of themselves, but also their identities. And here, if we try to look at the situation uh, with uh, displacement in Ukraine, we can say that certain elements uh, come in, can be comparable. For example, quite often uh, Crimean Tatars uh, and those experiences uh, of displacement and return and resettlement quite often uh, pass through the generations. And, and here we can compare, for example, Crimean Tatars, and we can also look at the uh, those who were resettled from, uh, who were displaced after the Second World War. And uh, in their families, this uh, identity was uh, for a, sometimes a core identity. And this identity was not only with the strategies, with memories, but identity itself was passed through generations. Uh, and this might create new lines uh, of inclusion or new lines of division. And for example, I remember presenting at one of the North American uh, societies uh, on newly displaced, uh, internally displaced people in Ukraine after 2014. And then uh, in reaction of one of the person who was present in the room was how dare you compare you're displaced with our experiences, experiences of our, our parents, uh, they cannot be compared. So uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, this might be happening. We, we might have different lines of divisions. And we also observe uh, partially this uh, issue in Ukraine, because in Ukraine, uh, currently we are talking and people are talking about the first wave or first displaced and a second displaced. And, and this first of displaced might quite often have uh, grievances because of how the state treated them uh, after the two, uh, 2014. And it took a lot, many, many advocacy campaigns to change the uh, bureaucratic laws and laws and, and, and the, the way how they were treated by the state bureaucrats. And now this new wave uh, has it much easier so we do have this lines of division based uh, on uh, identities uh, co connected to, to the refugee status or to memories connected to the displacement. And due to that, we also observe, we, we observed this phenomena with, with Oksana doing studies uh, after 2014, that uh, many people uh, refused to accept or refused to register. Um, even in many cases, if it creates economical difficulties or legal difficulties for them uh, in both previously within the Ukraine and now when they are outside of Ukraine, but they do not want to be labeled and do not want to have this label as a refugee. And similarly, uh, we should be very cautious when we are discussing these issues of uh, doing research or publications because many many people who moved uh, they do not want to be labeled or they do not want to be addressed as displaced or visionary or perselency and quite often they say that exactly we just temporarily uh, had to change our place of living or some of them are calling uh, new neighbors themselves or some other labels. Uh, so they are avoiding this uh, stigmatization and labeling, or trying to avoid also 
these lines of division. But another rationale for them is that actually, if uh, and it it is linked to their proactive position. If you are an active citizen and your position is uh, that you are helping your citizens, your compatriots in many places, so it doesn't matter where you live, even if, if you had to relocate, even you if you are facing uh, many humanitarian needs, but it does not mean that you should be uh, labeled only through or seen only through this perspective. And, and here I come to uh, Lubomir's point about the media representation. Yes, Ukrainians uh, are now covered uh, widely, and uh, but the problem is that if you look how they are covered or how they are portrayed, they are quite often portrayed very stereotypically. Similarly, this is not unique to Ukrainian uh, displacement as other displaced, as uh, really extremely uh, people in extreme need, in extreme poverty, uh, without agency. And this actually translates quite often to the, uh, the way how research is conducted. For example, uh, I was uh, part of discussions here in Germany about how to ask questions or what to ask. And in many cases, you will have, uh, I don't know, Question, many que questions about uh, how state was dealing, state institutions were dealing with you, how, I don't know, local institutions, how local volunteers were helping. But the very important question, which is obvious for them, is missing. Uh, what were self-aid uh, agencies and how you participated in this process? In the majority of cases, if you look both back backwards to to after 2014 we see and now it's even more visible both in ukrainian case and in, in our neighboring uh, countries that both international organizations and states who according to international law should be the first offering help and protection actually are quite late or sometimes very clumsy and over bureaucratized uh, overruled uh, and so on. So uh, what what was happening in Ukraine and uh, what really bolstered Ukraine's resilience that uh, millions of people were helping each other. They were and then they learned how to do it. And according to recent survey conducted by InfoSapiens in May, actually sixty five percent of Ukrainians claimed that they were helping those who were on move, displaced, but actually 25% of those displaced themselves claimed that they were helping. So even if you lost everything, if you, you are flying from the war, people are still helping each other. And this actually explains partially this gap in between uh, 7 million who moved to the uh, cross border and only 4 million, million those who registered because a big part of people do not want to be registered, quite often immobilized by these bureaucratic procedures and so on, uh, or do, were not willing to, to have this, this refugee uh, label. But we, we have very similar situation within the country. If you look at the data, we see that actually UN helped, according to the report, 2.5 million internally displaced. And we know from data that actually we have uh, close to 7 million displaced. Uh, so the big question is who is helping those other 5 million of displaced? Uh, and this needs to be discussed, I think, both uh, when we are talking about this displacement uh, of Ukrainians in, inside the country and outside of the country. And for this, I can also show you so now while I'm talking. So you can, can see uh, how uh, active Ukrainians were du during this, this period of, of time. Um, but uh, I also want to say that when we are talking about displacement, we, we should not be talking only about those who are displaced. We have also to talk about receiving communities. And uh, I we we see from the previous research on migration that uh, this migration issue can be used to uncover uh, 
hierarchies and politics of belonging, anxieties, concerns that lie in the heart of national identity, culture domin of dominant societies. Massive migration of Ukrainian displaced population fleeing Russian full-scale invasion since February spotlighted key questions uh, of intensive ongoing intellectual and also political disputes around such issues as integration, as belonging, as cohesion, as memory uh, issues in mo modern societies. And here again, I probably want to talk a little bit about the uh, role of diasporas, both Ukrainian and post-Soviet. Post um, if we look at the diaspora, which was uh, created post-Second World War, and this wave of, of people who moved to uh, cross-Atlantic or stayed in Europe, quite often these people were uh, very active, uh, creating new institutions and different kinds of organizations, uh, which helped uh, both to foster or keep identity, but also which were helping to uh, create a new knowledge uh, or uh, about Ukraine and contrabalance those, this knowledge which was pro uh, produced either in the Soviet Union, but also in many uh, Sovietology centers uh, across uh, North America or Europe. Uh, and here I can bring as, as an example both KUS or Harvard uh, Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, so this this is very important. But of course uh, we cannot talk or expect some something like this uh, currently from this new wave of displacement because as Ukraine uh, as Oksana said, uh, everything is just unfolding. So we don't know what will be happening and for how long it will be happening. But at the same time, uh, we can talk about, again, a new Ukrainian diaspora, uh, which was a labor migration diaspora. Uh, after the first, after the uh, attack of uh, Russia on Crimea first and on, on Donbass, if we look at the percent of people who, who were able to uh, claim the refugee status in Europe and actually out of those applications, only 2% of people were able to receive this status. So the only way till 2017 was uh, undocumented quite often labor migration. And since visa free regime, of course, the, the situation would change. And uh, by 2021, uh, Ukrainian labor migration wave was one of the biggest in Europe which created a network uh, of uh, help for those who would relocate. And our surveys uh, show uh, that at least in Europe, in majority of cases, people are located not, in, not so much in refugee centers, but qu uh, quite often uh, in uh, personal houses. And, and quite often these are either Ukrainians who already were there uh, as a labor migrant, but also uh, here a uh, very important role is of uh, post-Soviet diaspora with democratic uh, who were fleeing from uh, either Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan and many other countries from authoritarian regimes uh, to Europe uh, or post Second World War, uh, those who were fleeing. Uh, and, and people uh, quite often stepped in and wanted to help. Uh, but here uh, I also observe an, an potential for a conflict. Why? Because uh, when we are talking about uh, situation with, uh, with uh, migration governments, uh, I see another problem, which is that quite often local governments or activists are, are discussing such issues uh, as integration and under integration, they mean long language proficiency, access to education and so on. And very little is discussed about the social cultural uh, aspects of refugee adaptation and uh, changing collective and individual uh, communicative and cultural memories, which might be a, a both a potential for cooperation, or, uh, but also a potential for, for the conflict. And we already had two cases in Germany 
when uh, there were attempts to set on fire uh, Ukrainian shelters with, with Ukrainian uh, refugees. So uh, we also have to keep in mind these this issues when we are discussing current situation. And uh, I would also add to the status uh, of temporary protection, because for European situation, uh, this is very important one and needs to be discussed. First of all, why it was applied? Because the, the uh, UN Convention about Refugee was, uh, when it was uh, accepted, was post-war situation and it, it didn't include uh, war refugees. It was meant more to, to accommodate political or other types of refugees. So in both cases, when Europe had the biggest influx of, uh, of war refugees, uh, you, post-Yugoslav war and now the Ukrainian uh, situation, they try to apply this temporary protection. And uh, some people argue that some the special attention and solidarity and even preferential treatment of Ukrainians in Europe is first of all racist uh, because they are white and Christian and that's why they are uh, accepted much more willingly especially when, when people compare uh, to recent migrant crises in the EU, the pushbacks of uh, Muslim population refugees uh, from EU external borders uh, in Poland uh, and, and Lithuania, or by Italy, Greece, those who are trying to reach the EU borders uh, through the sea, uh, sea routes, or we can also name the situation which was occurring to Ukrainian refugees after 2014, uh, when, for example, uh, less than 2% would receive the status, but uh, Poland and Hungary was claiming that they are hosting millions of Ukrainians uh, to avoid the situation of uh, receiving Syrian, Syrian refugees. So first of all, Ukrainians are played as a card sometimes, but at the same time, uh, when we use this approach, uh, we again look at Ukrainians as a single group and we uh, avoid or ignore talking about the Ukrainian population's ethnic diversity, religious diversity, and many other diversities uh, they are representing. Uh, we also read that temporary protection is a, a directive uh, that as a response to war and, in, and again, this is a form of preferential treatment uh, because they, uh, they can move, they can apply for jobs. But uh, here, the, for me, a point of critique or rethinking would be that uh, this is a, creates a very precarious situation for Ukrainian uh, displaced because it's based on political rule. And has political climate change in Europe because of, I don't know, cold winter and uh, absence of energy or some other reasons, it can be withdrawn any moment and people would be just sim simply pushed back. Uh, and my final uh, moment, point, which I, I will just raise and, and we can discuss it, it later, uh, is uh, what what is very important to, to talk about is human capital drain, which is happening to Ukraine. This is German survey statistics. And what we see here, for example, that uh, at the early stages of uh, people, those people who moved to Germany, 93% of them ha had higher education. And according to many other surveys, we see that those people are not only highly educated, but they have a very uh, high uh, different types of skills with, with which they, they, they are coming. So the question is, first of all, whether their skills will be matched by the job markets or they will be pushed again to the very precarious types of uh, jobs uh, uh, reserved for, for, for displaced or for refugees. And then we, we can also think uh, what percent of them will continue, uh, return just because of that, because uh, they are pushed out of, of, of the society to, to the other social positions. And um, finally, if unfortunately the war will last for a longer time and people will gradually find their jobs, 
I know the re Polish report that according to their report, currently uh, of those who were displaced, 50% already either working or in the process of starting their jobs. So we really observe very intensive pros process of acquiring jobs and integrating economically into the societies. And then the question will be if uh, there will be moments when Ukrainians will receive a possibility to return to their uh, countries, what will happen to the economies of receiving countries? How much those economies will be hurt and how much actually they will be scared or willing to send Ukrainians back? Because, uh, for example, if we take such countries as Poland and Hungary or Czech Republic or many others, actually Ukrainian labor plays a very important role in their economies. And, and if we are talking about this human capital drain, it, they will be playing even more important role uh, during the next year or two. So uh, I guess these issues uh, are important to keep in mind and to be discussed when we are talking about Ukrainian displacement. Thank you very much uh, for all the contributions to this very, very interesting panel. Uh, and I'm very happy to go back to uh, our higher plane of comparisons. And maybe I can just throw a few comments and observations which I've been typing up here or, or putting down on a piece of paper. It, it is interesting to have a comparative perspective when it comes down to the post-World War II displacement and the one which is happening today, because we do see some parallels. I'm thankful for all of the contributors today in the panel to talk, uh, to focus on the, um, on the on following questions of national identity being on the rise or being uh, upheld uh, the most because of the circumstances with, under which the displacement has taken place. The genocidal war, as it's happening right now, finds it parallels in how the displaced persons coming from Ukrainian lands post World War II have seen and have been experiencing the war back then as well. I wanted to come back to questions of multi-ethnic Ukraine, which Victoria has touched upon that and how that plays into the current uh, narratives and current perspectives and, and in, in elevations and the increase of this national spirit of Ukrainians. And we didn't touch upon the gender dimension of that whole entire crisis uh, unfolding. We know the majority of those who have left Ukraine and in nearby countries, especially they are represented by you know, 90 plus percent of those who have come to Poland are women, 80 plus percent who've come to Lithuania and Baltic states are women and so on and so forth. And I really don't have my, uh, my handle on that statistics on what was going on in post-World War II. I don't know whether Lyubo Mary, you, you, you have looked into that as well, but I will go into the background and I will ask you, the presenters, perhaps to raise questions to each other at this point, or perhaps even reflect on a couple of my <laughs> points as well. Fine, uh, if I can perhaps reflect on a couple of the comments were made by the other two speakers that I found quite interesting, by the way. Um, Victoria was talking about the intergenerational consequences of forcible displacement. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I guess I am. Uh, one of those, because I, I grew up in that environment that you should not forget who you are, where we came from, why we came here, why we were forced to come here, even though Canada was very good to my parents, and they're very grateful. But that, that consequence of what happened to them is actually reflected in me, which I've never really sort of spent too much time thinking about, but it is a kind of an intergenerational continuation of their experience, because as uh, a geographer once wrote that ideas are light baggage. So and my mother used to say, you know, they can take away your house, they can blow up your, your city, they can devastate your community. But if you get away, you still have what's in your mind. And you can perpetuate that. Um, another uh, interesting point that was made that I thought anyway, was um, how in a sense, and Natalka just mentioned it, demography is destiny. Ukraine is losing large numbers of young women of childbearing age. 
So in some cases, they're leaving with their children. In some cases, they're leaving alone. Uh, and again, just listening to you, I was thinking, well, wait a minute, what's happening in Kingston? I think there are two men in Kingston, one a teenager, perhaps two teenagers, and one man who was with his family on vacation outside of Ukraine when the war began. The rest are all young women with children or student-aged women. Um, what happens to Ukraine when it loses a significant proportion of the female population of the country. I don't think that happened in the Second World War. I think in the Second World War, you had a much uh, more relatively balanced um, population of displaced persons and refugees than you do now. And this is because partially of, of Ukraine's understandable decision to say that if you're between 16 and 55 or 60, whatever it is, you can't leave unless you have so many children and so on, because Ukraine needs to defend itself. It can't have all of its men running away. Um, there was a cartoon that came around the other day that said Ukrainian men um, send their, you know, uh, send their women and children away. Russian men leave their women and children behind. I mean, Ukrainian men are staying to defend their country against the aggressor. And so there is this disproportionate weight, um, a gender weight in, in the immigration or in internally displaced. The ones that leave and don't come behind, that is going to be a serious loss to Ukraine. There's no doubt about that. And I think, as was mentioned also by Victoria and, and hinted at by uh, Oksana, there will be... Um, a consequence because not all of these people will return. You know, it, like, as I said, I think in my presentation, life goes on. And so if you are a young woman by yourself, or even a young mother, and your husband or partner is killed or lost in the war, what do you do? Are you really going to go back to Ukraine to a community that's been destroyed, to a, a city that's been essentially erased? Or are you going to build yourself a new life here in Canada or in the United States? I think that that will have consequences. So, um, you know, I, I think for us in our discussion, really it's that, and none of us can predict it, but where is Ukraine's national identity going? And that has a demographic component. It has what I hinted at at the end of my presentation, a component that's related to the fact that this identity is being forged in battle, in effect. I think that's going to have a profound impact on uh, the, not the diversity, because Ukraine will remain like any other European country, a multicultural, multi-confessional society, but the citizenship component of it, or that who am I as a Ukrainian will be less about, well, I speak Ukrainian, my grandfather spoke Ukrainian, we're all Ukrainian. It doesn't matter that someone speaks Russian as their mother tongue. It doesn't matter that someone is of, of Jewish faith or heritage like the president. Uh, who cares, right? Nobody cares anymore. Uh, sure, in the past, the stereotypes, we're all aware of them. But the reality of it is, I think what's happened in Ukraine, particularly since 2014, but very particularly since this year in, in February of uh, 22, is that Ukrainians have come together in a way that I, I couldn't have anticipated. And the way in which the world looks at us legitimizes that. Because when, when my parents came, you know, people told me in my life that there's no such thing as a Ukrainian, that Ukrainians don't exist. They didn't, they didn't use terms like Malorus, like we all talk about, you know, the Russians calling us little Russians. You'd see that in the literature from time to time. But people would just say, there's no such thing as Ukraine. Show me on a map. And you'd look and there'd be the Soviet Union and there'd be a region and it would be sub-labeled, you know, in a smaller print, uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. But people didn't buy it. Now, find me anyone anywhere who says that Ukrainians don't exist. My neighbors have Ukrainian flags. They're Scottish. They've got a Ukrainian flag flying on a flagpole. Um, we've all seen this in Canada. I don't know how, but you know, I'm sure you've seen it in Europe as well. All sorts of non-Ukrainians are behind Ukraine's struggle to defend itself against this genocidal agenda of Mr. Putin and his Confederates. I think that creates an, uh, a climate of opinion in the world 
that reinforces a different kind of civic national identity in Ukraine that brings it into Europe and will keep it in Europe, certainly once this war is over. Not question too, but maybe I'm reacted for, for some statements because it's, it's really very interesting and we have a very common experience in thinking about all of this. And first of all, I want to react it to Victoria's statement about this new type of division in Ukrainian society. We usually talk about division like a problem, um, like something which have for us negative connotation. But I want to propose to you to look on this situation from other point of view. For example, many internally displaced people who um, have this experience from 2014 became an expert who uh, uh, know what to do in the situation of shelling during the full-scale war. It's as absolutely new and very interesting situation. And we see how during all this time, all this eight years before full-scale war, we create these new levels of unity in society, in Ukrainian society. It's a long way. It's a, it's a very difficult way. But now we have this... Uh, very very specific situation when on the one hand we talk about this division in negative way but on the other hand we understand that this segmentation play a very important role and perceive positively in ukrainian society it's our result it's our result of this long way from the starting of uh, the first wave of russian aggression and maybe i wanted to come back and uh, add something when we talk about this um, comparison between uh, this wave of uh, forced displacement after World War II and now. And uh, um, from my point of view, it's very important to understand not only the similarity of these waves, but to talk about some difference between two. And uh, if the um, refugees after the Second World War, in many cases, uh, had no place to return to, and Pan Lubomir talk about this, uh, in the present context, we have a substantially different situation. At the moment, most of Ukrainian territory remains unsafe, but under the control of the Ukrainian government. It's absolutely different situation. We have much of our territory which are under control of Ukrainian government. Most host communities have developed policies and aim to integrate Ukrainian refugees into both local communities and the labor market. And now we see how it works here in Europe. Most refugees are able to travel to and from Ukraine which is uh, confirmed by border crossing statistic. We see this statistic, we know how often people come, they uh, have a vacation and go to Ukraine. And of course, uh, behind this, stay in these divided families walls. It's very important to understand how it's work in this case. And they had, uh, um, and many Ukrainians uh, really have this opportunity to uh, you um, to come back to, to uh, their previous life for for small time for for short period of the time. We already talk about the fact that in most cases we are dealing with divided families, most of which will seek to re uh, reunite themselves. And it will be a motivation when we're thinking about these future consequences, how it will go. But many families, we, we have these divided families on the one hand, and many of them want to reunite this family. In our studies of migration in Poland and France, for example, uh, we tried to calculate the time, we, uh, how many person need, how many time person need uh, uh, to reorient his or her plans towards the country of arrival. And in Poland, due to the clarity of the language and proximity of the cultural environment, this process takes six months, half a year, only half a year. And after this person start thinking about a new life in new location. But mm -hmm. however, in France, for example, adaptation is strongly related to language acquisition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the process is longer, at least three years. It needs much more time. Now uh, uh, we see this process in progress here in Europe. It's as an argument when we try to uh, assess the situation, uh, uh, who come back, how many people come back, and uh, uh, then. And in these conditions, a good indicator for the future of Ukrainian refugees can be how it intensively and successfully they learn the language of the country of arrival. For example, in Germany without language skills at the level of B1 and A2 for 
in-demand professions, you will not have access to the labor market, and therefore you will not receive a visa in future. Therefore, once the war in Ukraine is over, the decision to return may not so much be a free choice, but rather a situation that depends on the policies of particular European states towards the Ukrainian refugees in the future. It's not free choice, and we need to understand this. I'm also not sure that we can uh, draw lessons for today Ukrainian refugees from the experience of emigrant communities uh, because we have absolutely different conditions. If life in radically new conditions uh, uh, now, um, when, when we usually talk about this uh, wave of migration after Second World War, we talk about the people who need to be in contact with others, who need to be a part of the community. And very often it was a closed community. If people help each other, but now we have absolutely other situation. There are a lot, a, a lot of electronic services available to refugees, which allow them to solve many problems without others, people. It's possible to solve many problems using only the different kind of apps from employment, registration of uh, 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 documentation processes to psychological assistance, which are very important for, for many uh, uh, people who are forcibly relocated. It is also worth considering the psychological status, status uh, of most refugees, the ongoing war, forced displacement, a significant set of domestic problems that are difficult to solve in a foreign country Trauma, fears, all this also complicates the situation with intra-group communication and one may, why many people prefer to use different kind of apps, different kind of electronic communication. It's really on the one hand help them make their life here better, but on the other hand help him to deal with this problematic of uh, um, character of intergroup communication here. We have absolutely new reality. We have absolutely new reality which are create a new type of uh, this intergroup communication, interpersonal communication, uh, and uh, etc. And um, I still come back to my previous idea. Um, we, we, we could talk about very different factors which are influenced on this situation, but um, we need to understand that uh, this a decision to stay or return will deeply connected to the situation on the front line, directly uh, uh, connected to the success of the Ukrainian armed forces action. And of course, uh, duration of the war play a very important role. I talk about this half a year, three years. It's very important to understand that we still talk about this process reality and why it's difficult to uh, look on the, our future in this case. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you, Lubomir. Um, we absolutely are in a state of flux when it comes down to research and current displacement, given the situation still unfolding with the war. But we do have a question in the chat here, and I will read it out loud, coming from Taras Lupu. Чи здатен ринок праці приймаючих країн задовольнити якісь якісні вміння і навики українців, Польща, ФРН, як приклад? Якщо ні, то виштовхне назад то виштовхне назад до України. Питання стосується без, рівня безробіття в Україні, 30% чи приблизно так, щоб уявити цю цифру, це відсутність 5 мільйонів робочих місць. Чи, це, чи наявність цих робочих місць мотивує повернення людей до України? Як вам здається? Я думаю, що... Well, what uh, Oksana was just saying a moment ago, um, you know, stay or return will depend on the duration of the war and, and the amount of time people spend abroad. That's, that's certainly true. But the other dimension of this is the rebuilding of Ukraine and its infrastructure and its cities is the work of a generation. Um, it's not that rebuilding can't happen uh, effectively and quickly. Think of post-World War II Germany, um, and yet it takes time. So I think, unfortunately, you know, given the circumstances, we have to say that, 
the rebuilding of Ukraine will provide <laughs> pretty close to full employment, I would think. Um, and it will cost billions of dollars, which hopefully will be provided in large measure by reparations paid by the aggressor state. But I, I, I don't think that the employment issue is going to be critical in terms of preventing people from returning. Thank you. I have a question to Victoria and Oksana, if I may. Um, we obviously are watching over the uh, profound interests of Ukraine in the field of refugee studies. We also are in a time, we live in a time when we have no certainty of what would be the outcomes of the ongoing uh, war in Ukraine and what would be its timeline. Uh, coming to the research needs, very practical question. What needs to be now happening in the field of studies? What work needs to be undertaken for you colleagues in history and in sociology for the rest of us to benefit from and to be able to comment on the um, picture which usually is painted first by the sociologists. What is happening in the field right now and where should it head? Mm, there are many levels, if I may. First of all, the level of uh, scholar, refugee scholars, uh, because what I observe again, I less I know less about the situation in Northern America, and I know better what's happening in Europe. Uh, first of all, quite often uh, these are short-term positions, and imagine you came with your family, with kids, with everything. Imagine European bureaucracy, so it takes months to register somewhere, and after three months you have to move, and sometimes uh, you have to move not only. Uh, within the country, because you are not always able to find uh, the placement within the country, sometimes you might find a scholarship in a nearby country. Uh, and the question is how to continue your research if you start it and you have only three or four months. And what I see the longest positions available are two years, but they are very rare. In majority of cases, there's a few months or one year. And this is the big issue and question. Uh, another and another issue is that uh, again, uh, this is maybe more German specific. But what we have, we have either specific uh, regional studies centers, and quite often this would be uh, post-Soviet, post or uh, East Slavic centers with uh, mostly focusing on. Russia and very little expertise on Ukraine or some other regional constellations and then you find yourself alone in in the group of scholars because nobody knows about Ukraine or nobody does research on Ukraine and you have to fit yourself somewhere there or uh, this would be again this is the German case when the uh, the the chair has a one project and you have to fit yourself into this project. And quite often people are quite lonely there because they come, they receive positions, but they they, they are not included in it, into networks. Uh, so, and quite often scholarships include, you receive a scholarship, but you are supposed to do a research. And uh, just quite recently we had a presentation and one of our colleague was saying, I'm doing this and this and this, uh, talking about your research. And then the colleague from Germany said, and how many people are in your network? And she said, I'm alone. I have one uh, a scholarship to survive. So again, this is uh, the issue of resources, of uh, networking and long-term studies as well. And again, if we are doing research on displacement, uh, uh, quite often, if we see what are the current discussions, current discussions will be that it would be good to have a longitudinal project when we see transformations, but then we have we need to have, again, teams and resources being able to implement this. And so these are very important issues, plus gender aspect, as you as I said. If you are a woman with the elderly and kids, you cannot be constantly moving from one place to the other one. 
You know, I might just jump in there and say that one of the things that I'd like to see in scholarship uh, more generally is a re-evaluation and a reorientation away from great Russian studies. There's this kind of Russophilia that permeated the West, Germany, just one of many countries where this overemphasis on the imperial state to the detriment of regional studies of other nations and countries within the orbit of the empire, whether it's Russian, Tsarist, Soviet, or post-Soviet, um, obviously has really hobbled uh, the understanding of most Western states about Ukraine and all the other states that were once part of the Soviet Union, which I think you're suggesting, and has left the, the study of Ukraine or the Baltic states or what have you without the resources that should be dedicated to it. I mean, I would love in the German case to see the kind of psychological scholarly reorientation that the political community went through a few months ago when they said, oh my God, we've got to change Germany's foreign policy and military policy to cope with the new realities. Well, these are the new realities. Germans should be studying Ukraine far more than they are or have been. They shouldn't be surprised. And in fact, you know, perhaps it's a little bit in, in, impolite of me to say this, but I noticed that just a few months ago, Poland made the claim that Germany owes reparations in the 1.3 trillion uh, range for what happened on Polish territory during the German occupation in World War II. What happened in Ukraine was much worse. Um, and so Germany, which was very slow to come forward with anything more than some very modest humanitarian aid, has now stepped up to the plate more than it had been on the military side, but still, I think, owes Ukraine, owes Ukraine, and I'll use that very carefully, but very precisely, um, a reconsideration. After all, this is a, a near neighbor as compared to Russia, uh, is a country with which Germany has had interactions, both negative and positive, at the 20th and 21st centuries, and clearly needs to understand. So, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not hopeful on this, but I, I would certainly think that the kind of fetish that so many Western countries have had with Russia will, in the light of the atrocities and the war crimes and the genocide that's been perpetrated by the Russian nation and its leadership in these last several months in particular, will reconsider what they study and what they think about. A point of absolute importance. I cannot disagree with this at all. Um, I was wondering, Oksana, you wanted to add something to it. If it's possible, I want to jump back to, to this question in the chat, to the first part of this question, because I think it's a very, very important to, to understand some, some details here. But uh, we have a double language seminar, and because the question was in Ukrainian, I switch on Ukrainian language. Uh, and uh, I would like to turn on this question, чи виштовхнеться українців назад до України? Це, це дуже складне питання і не обов'язково, чому я хочу на цьому наголосити, не обов'язково виштовхне. Я ґрунтуюся в даному випадку на наших результатах, пов'язаних з вивченням трудової міграції українців до Європи. Ринок праці приймаючих країн не може задовольнити якісні вміння і навички українців. Ми завжди кажемо про overqualificated. Наші мігранти мають більшу освіту, ніж треба для тих посад і тих робочих місць, які вони зазвичай мають в Європі. Тобто вони до цієї ситуації звикли. І більше того, мало хто з них погодився б на таку роботу у власній країні, бо тут спрацьовує тиск середовища, сприйняття з боку сусідів, друзів і таке інше, але легко погоджуються на це, коли працює за кордоном і коли має мету заробити грошей для якихось своїх українських норм. Тобто ця ситуація не є новою для українських трудових мігрантів. Тому не обов'язково вона буде працювати на виштовхування 
От. І, і це теж треба розуміти. Коли ми намагаємося розібратися усіма цими чинниками, які допоможуть нам, зрештою, працювати з тими дірами в соціально-демографічній структурі, ми абсолютно свідомо про це все говоримо. От. І цей дисбаланс, з яким ми зіштовхнемося, не тільки цей дисбаланс, а нам треба розуміти, що попереду у нас буде суспільство з людьми, які травмовані психологічно і фізично. У нас дуже багато травмованих людей. І це дуже важливе питання, яке нам теж треба розуміти. І це теж частина тої нашої майбутньої реальності, з якою нам треба буде працювати. Дякую, Оксана. Дякую, Люба Мир. Дякую, Вікторія. Чи ви маєте інші питання, щоб відповідати, щоб розповідати, коли ми маємо цю можливість, рару можливість, щоб говорити can I step in? Uh, I want a little bit to comment on uh, Lubomir's statement that Ukraine is forging its new civic identity. And I agree and disagree with you in a sense, because if we take this position, then we take the position that actually Putin created Ukraine in a sense. And from uh, my research, which was conducted before the Euromaidan, we already see that political nation and political civic nation uh, type of identity was present in Ukraine before. For example, uh, we conducted a, a survey in March 2013, and when people were asked to self-identify, over 76% people in Donbass uh, self-identified as Ukrainians. And language issue was not in so 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 strongly politicized already at this moment. And of course, post Euromaidan, uh, with the situation of of uh, annexation of Crimea and and, and beginning of the conflict over Donbas, it was further developing. But it's very important to keep in mind that in reality, it's not because of the but we already had several revolutions. And what was very important for Ukrainians and what differentiates, for example, right now this conflict. This is not an ethnic conflict. This is a value conflict. And for Ukrainians, these values were already very important part of their national or citizenship identity, even before the Euromaidan. I, I would agree, but I think my point is that in 1991, when the collapse of the Soviet Union occurred, you still had a large number of people who were born in the Soviet period, thought like Soviets, if I can put it that way, since 1991. And when you're talking about a survey in 2013, you're talking about people who were born in many cases after 1991. And very clearly the Orange Revolution, the Euromaidan Revolution, Revolution of Dignity occurred as people articulated liberal democratic European values and a desire to be part of the European community, which now Ukraine is on its way to becoming. So I, I agree with all of that. I don't think Putin created Ukraine. I think Putin initiated a war against Ukrainian Ukrainians that has given Ukrainians, in effect, a war of independence that will finally be fought and won, I'm certain, uh, and that will then cement that liberal democratic, we are part of Europe identity into the, the sort of fabric of, of Ukrainian being. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We do have another question in the chat and it is about the following. Please tell us whether it's known what might be the main reasons for displaced people to choose a certain country to move in. In the literature, it's usually the first place you can get to that's safe. <laughs> I, I mean, guess this would be a variety of reasons, of course, in, in many cases, especially if you know, remember the numbers, the, the speed and of displacement and number of people displaced was highest ever seen. So you have a huge wave of people living. And in this case, you exactly you get where you can get. And actually, in many cases, this was step by step. So those who left from one part of the territory were uh, giving their places for those who were coming from, from behind. Uh, 
but uh, we also what i mentioned the role of uh, different types of diaspora labor migration diaspora post-soviet diasporas uh, were also very important because then or for example different types of uh, social networks exchange uh, experiences people had so then they were reaching to either their friends or relatives or uh, looking for someone who like diaspora people would say hey I, I I understand what was happening to you because I'm of Belarusian origin and please come and stay with me and so on. So uh, this would be, uh, we will also have uh, another wave uh, which was connected to the medical uh, experiences because many people in Ukraine could not get the medical treatment they, they required. Uh, and in this case, probably they would be choosing certain countries which provide better uh, support in the, of, of their needs and so on. Thank you. Very different reasons staying behind this decision and behind these strategies. For example, uh, of course, many people come to Poland because they have a very close relation. They perceive this space like more, more uh, understandable and uh, the way uh, how to adopt to this society uh, looks much more easy. On, uh, on the other hand, for example, uh, if we are looking on uh, current situation in Germany, if you choose this country, you need to have a support here because it's a very difficult first three or four months uh, when these uh, documentation processes, uh, which are very bureaucratic here, takes much time and you need to have a different kind of support during all this stage. It's much more complicated than uh, it's, for example, in Poland, but then you have a much more better conditions uh, and uh, uh, much more big support from, from the state. And uh, of course, in all these cases, each person has their own motivation, their own circle uh, of communication, who uh, um, uh, communicate with people who informed, who help, who consult, how it's possible to organize everything. And I think uh, here we, we need to talk on the level of uh, different countries and different policies uh, uh, on the one hand, but uh, on the other hand, from the point of view of individual motivation and individual scenario, how, how to uh, access uh, countries. And uh, yes, I'm still here. One, one point that Oksana made earlier that I think perhaps we need to underscore as well is that the role of uh, telecommunications, of the internet, of FaceTime, of Zoom, of, of all these technological marvels, that I say that as an old man now, all, all these things that have been created in the last decade or two connect people and allow people to access services and consult and share ideas uh, in a way that never existed before. Again, when you're thinking about the post-World War II immigrants who had no communication with Ukraine. So I remember just again, it's an anecdote, but when my father's mother died, he only found out because a neighbor wrote to a neighbor who wrote to someone in America that, have you heard that so-and-so passed away last year? It took my father almost a year to find out that his mother had died. And I remember how he went into a period of mourning as a result of that. So nowadays, communication is instant and, and global, or, or essentially, it can be disrupted, obviously. But I think that is another very important factor in the way in which this wave of displaced persons internally and externally uh, will um, relate to the rest of the world and will then relate to what becomes of Ukraine after the war. Thank you. We are seeing questions coming our way just about 10 minutes before the official end of our discussion here. Um, I would probably uh, ask us to briefly reflect on the one here. Very big question. Can we imagine what might change, what changes the current crisis, refugee crisis could bring to what the person calls Ukrainian mentality after the war? Very big question. Maybe it's, start, 
I think in this question we come back to this issue about Ukrainian identity, not about mentality, we talk about identity. But what problems I, I see here when we talk about this, for example, um, we start talking about this um, new model of civic identity in Ukraine, but for example, if you ask uh, people in Ukraine, who are you? asking about national identity or ethnic identity when you receive this answer i'm ukrainians you never you can never know for sure what person mean in this case because it might be national identity it might be um, ethnic identity in this case it's very difficult to work with this why in this case we use in-depth interview with qualitative paradigm and uh, i reconstruct this different kind of models how people create how they build their identity and usually it's a very mixed form when a person use uh, different kind of indicators and uh, talk about the common blood and talk about the common history common uh, historical heritage on the one hand but on the other hand talk about the flag about the state symbols about the common uh, political entity sit, uh, uh, state like a political entity it's 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 a very mixed form and it's a very complicated task to reconstruct what we really mean mean when we uh, describe themselves like Ukrainians. But on the one hand, it's, it's, a, it's a very problematic it's not, because it's not so clear. But on the other hand, it's a very good opportunity to work with this super diversity, with, with this uh, um, really, real, very interesting and complicated realities. But now we see how we pushed people to rethink their identity. It's other very important moment and we see how many people reconstruct their identity, for example, uh, on this first stage of Russian aggression and we work with people, uh, for example, uh, who start thinking about themselves like Ukrainians and it's very interesting to look how they create their new identity and in this new identity I see for example on the one hand uh, it's it's really re-understanding yourself like a part of Ukrainian state of Ukrainian nation but on the other hand it's a sense uh, of a uh, mm, some kind of pretense to the state. I am a citizen of Ukraine. Please, state, help help me in this in this situation. It's a it's a very very complicated uh, things and why it's so complicated task to give a, a clear answer to this question. What what's what's change? I think many change. Of course, so we we will have many change in in this perception of us during the war time. But it's still very complicated task to to construct this model. What what it's mean for us now to be Ukrainians. You know, I think, I, I think one of the things that perhaps I should have mentioned about the post-World War II experience is that many Ukrainians come, or people coming from different parts of Ukraine who ended up in Western Europe in the refugee camps, the so-called DP camps run by UNRWA and then IRL, um, their identity coalesced in those camps because they were in the camps for several years and subject to an educational and a religious uh, schooling or shaping by the political groups that came to dominate those camps, and particularly Bandarivici, frankly. So a large number of the people that went through the refugee camps found themselves in a very um, nationalistic environment. Some rejected it, rebelled against it, but the majority were kind of, in a sense, shaped by that experience. I think every one of us today, and most of our, our, our listeners or viewers, will probably say this is wonderful that Ukraine's national identity is evolving in a liberal democratic way. It had already begun to do that, as Victoria and Oksana both said, after 1991, and particularly, you know, even before 2014, people were starting to think, we're, well, we're European, and now we've had this impetus to even rally behind the flag, right? Doesn't matter who you are by ethnic background. We're all together in this because we're Ukrainians and we see the flags and we see the military uh, achieving battlefield success. And I and I pray that we're, we're right in this. But and maybe this is a terrible question for me to throw on the floor a few minutes before the end of the session. Well, what if we lose the war? What happens then to national identity? Do we go back to that paradigm after World War I when people said, 
wow, we were betrayed. Uh, we, you know, the Ukrainian National Republic did not survive. We were, you know, uh, rejected by the West. We, we weren't listened to at the Paris Peace uh, Conference. We had better become, you know, really tough. Uh, and that gave rise to an ideology that started in the right wing, no doubt about it. It evolved later, of course. We know Oun and Upa evolved. But the the impetus right after World War I was to, to go very hard uh, um, politically because of that sense that the status quo of Europe did not accommodate Ukrainian identity, much less statehood. So be careful. We could be, we could be, could, we could be going the other way. You know, when President Zelensky talked about a new Israel, in some ways, that's a very bold and, and evocative way of describing it. But it's got a downside, and I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, that's right. I will step out of a national identity box and say that uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, for before Ukraine was quite immobile country, so people uh, were not moving even within the same regions. So we have right now, will we have a lot of experience both within the country, exchanges of experiences and outside of the country as well. Uh, we also, this was quite paternalistic in a, in a sense and patriarchal uh, in many pockets country where people expected that state will do for them many things and uh, or their husbands would decide. And now when we have this uh, young uh, women traveling abroad and having to stay on their own, they have a deep difficulties, but after they overcome and, and after having this new experiences, new skills, uh, new knowledge, uh, new roles they play, uh, this will also change the country because people learn how to move, learn new skills, new businesses, uh, new roles, and this might impact country quite strongly, I would say. Thank you very much. We do have a few more questions in the chat, but we do not have time. Unfortunately, our time has come up as we all have other commitments on the go here. I wanted to thank our presenters today for daring to step into this conversation, which was formulated in a rather challenging way. On one way, we're tempted to embrace pan perspective historically, uh, grounded perspective on displacement of Ukrainians throughout the 20th century due to war and other cataclysms. But on the other hand, given the nature of the ongoing war and the huge degree of uncertainty of how events will unfold, we simply are not equipped with that long-term perspectives as historians or social scientists to ably comment on what is going to happen next. This is only an indication to me that more conversations of that kind should continue, more research needs to happen. And I'm looking forward to hearing the outcomes of whatever studies will be on the way, hopefully very soon, focusing on the dimensions of displacement globally of Ukrainians. So I'd like to thank yet again our participants. I'd like to thank all of the attendees and those in Ukraine who have stayed with us. I also am thankful to all the partners in our series and sessions. And uh, until next uh, connecting, uh, until next seminar, which will be announced very soon on social media. Thank you very much. And if panelists want to stay inside of the panel for a few more minutes to for quick debriefing, I I certainly would like that. Thank you. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Slava. Hello, Slava.